Amen. As I was saying this morning, over the evenings when we are together, our, our theme uh, that we have been looking at, it, it might be just entitled, it's just the fact is it, it, it's daring, daring to, to draw near, and to, that's daring to draw near to God. And we're looking at people who had what we might call, in many ways, re- very spectacular encounters with God. We might be thinking about people like Abraham, uh, Elijah, Moses, and tonight it's Job. People who had, in that sense, that face-to-face encounter uh, with God. Uh, Summarized, I think, in verse 5 of the chapter we have just read uh, this evening, if you look at it, it says, you know, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. When Job's writing that, what he's saying is that before this, I had a bit of an understanding of you, God. I, I understood how you, or at least I thought I understood a bit about how you, you deal and interact. I had a certain amount of knowledge. I believed in you. I obeyed you. I understood something of that. But now, something significant has happened and that I've really, really understood in the penny and the penny has dropped. That encounter with God is always life-changing when we have that maybe very unusual encounter. And I think an encounter with God in that way that actually we get a knowledge of God inevitably means that you have a new appreciation of who you are. So a knowledge of God impacts the knowledge of self. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of abuse uh, at home uh, because of something I've started to read. I thought it was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, so what better thing to read than the copy of Calvin's Institutes, which I probably haven't looked at uh, since I was in college, so I went out and got myself a a new copy. And uh, I thought, I was reading somewhere that if you only read two or three pages a day, you can get through the entire book in a year, and what better thing uh, to read. Uh, so I've been doing that. And, and even very early on, if you were to read Calvin, you get a very clear understanding that this was a man who was so saturated in his understanding of God, it just saturates everything that he says, is that there is so much that, that we've got to know about God. And immediately, one big theme of, of Calvin when he writes is that actually, when you do understand who God is, you will know yourself more deeply. And actually, Calvin would say, true knowledge is to have a knowledge of God and a knowledge of yourself. And until you have those two aspects, you don't really have this true knowledge. And so encountering God will always mean that you have a new encounter about yourself. You can think of Peter in the New Testament as well. Remember the time when Peter uh, was out uh, after Jesus' uh, death and his resurrection. Peter didn't know what to to, um, to do with himself and he's out fishing he doesn't know what he, he, to do and he meets the, the risen Lord and he gives him some instructions and the reaction from all of that when Peter realizes uh, that this is true that this is real he just falls at Jesus feet and what he says in those moments of course is that depart from me because I'm the sinner so when you really encounter God in a new way it does impact you as well And so I want to try, and maybe you do have a bit of an idea what Job's about. Uh, The the background to the book of Job, in case your your knowledge of that is reasonably limited, uh, is that Job was a man who is described here as he feared God, he, he shunned evil, he was an upright man, he was a devout man, he was an extremely wealthy man. And in Job chapter 1, Uh, we get this sense that actually uh, God permits Satan to attack Job. Uh, You see that? If you were to flick over to Job chapter 1 and verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, uh, everything he has in your power is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. It's crucial that we actually see that little word. It's as if God is saying here, You can do what you like with a man up to a certain degree. So you can do that, but not this. And what we need to remind ourselves is even at the very beginning of the book of Job, 
God is still in control. God is still higher, and he's still stronger. So that no matter what actually happens to Job, don't ever forget that actually God is still in control. So that's clear, and it's clearly there from the, from the very beginning. It's important that you see it. But what happens in Job chapter 1 uh, is that one day Job's standing, and uh, he's standing in his home, and a messenger comes up to him. And he says, look, I was out with all, all your cattle, and suddenly we were attacked, and these plunderers came, and they took all your cattle, and they killed everybody else. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you the tale. And then it says, as soon as he had heard that, a second servant comes running up to him. He says, I was down with your sheep. And then the lightning come on. And actually, the lightning storm was so severe that uh, it killed everything. All the sheep, they're all gone. All the people who were down there, all your servants, they're gone. And then a third one arrives, and he says something similar about the camels. All those camels were there, but they're gone. And then finally, a fourth one comes. And he says, look, I, I was down in the home of your, of your sons and, and all, all your sons and your daughters, your, your seven sons, your, your three daughters were there and they were in having a party. And uh, they're all dead because this wind came and the roof came in and everything's gone. And Job, in that moment, of course, now, I mean, he's lost his family. He's lost all his family, apart from his wife. He's lost all his kids. He's lost all his possessions. So Job has immediately gone from being a very wealthy man to a man who's got nothing. It's all gone. But in Job 1, we see that in some ways Job keeps it together. Because as you read verses 21 and into 22, this is Job's response to that. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So at this point, he's kept it together. He's reacting biblically, we might say, to what's going on. He's got a perspective that God is somehow in behind this. And then Satan has another strike attack this time. And uh, again, this time, if you were to look back again to chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 6. But note again this idea. Satan, you can do this, but you can't do that. Verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Again, God is ultimately in control. However, this time, it is too much for Job. Uh, Satan does a couple of things here. The first thing is that he attacks his health. We're told uh, in chapter 2 is that Job is afflicted with running sores. He sits on an ash heap. He scrapes himself with pot or pieces of broken pottery, uh, and he scrapes the pus off his, his body. It says that he is afflicted with sores from his toes to his head. So he's in a miserable state. And then the other thing that Satan does here is, or that, and God permits, is that God permits Satan to bring Job some terrible counselors in the form of his wife and his three best mates. So that's Job's wife and his friends, who are called Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. Uh, and these people have two different approaches. Job's wife comes up to him and says, Job, just curse God and die. It's all God's fault. God is the miserable one. Just say you hate God and it'll be all over. And his three mates have something different to say. They say, Job, we have never met a good guy to whom all this has happened. So you must be at fault. So whereas his wife said, it's God's fault, his mates are saying, Job, it's your fault. So either way, you can see that he's got two miserable crowds of friends. And then for the next uh, 30 chapters in the book of Job, it just goes back and forward between him and his mates. And throughout all of this, Job says a couple of things. The first thing is that Job says is that I am innocent. I am an innocent 
sufferer. I am a righteous man. I am a good man. That's the first thing he says. I'm innocent. His mates don't believe him, but he says it. And the second thing that Job says is that actually I'm cut off from God. God is nowhere near me. Actually, if you were to turn to Job chapter 23, um, and if you were reading through Job chapter 23, particularly, say, um, verses 3 and down into those verses, uh, you've got this sense what Job is actually saying here is that I'm so far cut off from God. You know, if I knew where to find God, if I knew where he was, I would go and I would tell God exactly what's going on. And I would tell God what he needs to do. And I would tell him what he needs to put right. But I can't find him anywhere. If I knew where he was, I would tell him what's wrong. But as it is, I can't find him anywhere. So throughout all of this, Job's saying two things. First of all, I'm an innocent man. And the second thing is, is that I'm cut off. And that goes on, I said, for 30 odd chapters. Finally, towards the end of the book, chapter 38. If you turn to chapter 38, you'll see the heading at the start of chapter 38, and it says, The Lord speaks, because now God intervenes. And he appears. And the pictures up behind me, was, it says, it's like a whirlwind. It's a storm. It's, it's like a visible uh, representation of God's presence. And it's that that appears to Job. And out of that storm, God speaks to him. And chapter 38, this is when we read or when we hear what God actually says to Job. And if you were to read chapter 38, there's some interesting things. The first thing. I don't know what you would expect God to say in this moment. But God gives no explanations at all. Now, if we have been reading through the book of Job, we would get hints that God's up to something. I've already hinted at that myself. God's in control, no matter what happens. And so God must have good purposes behind everything. And that there are ways in which God is trying to enrich Job's life. There are, there are ways in which God is trying to hone at Job, deepen his experience, change Job, make him into more of a man who is more useful to God. So God has all manners of purposes. But in chapter 38, he doesn't say anything about that. Job has been asking for chapters and chapters and chapters here. He says, God, I need to know why. I need to know what you're up to. But when God speaks here, God doesn't say a word. Not one word about it. And the second thing I think that we should note, that when God actually gets around to speaking here, and he speaks to Job for the first time, is that he doesn't give Job any comfort at all. And yet you would expect him you know, to do something comforting, metaphorically, put his arms around him, hug him. Uh, but what God does is that he relentlessly goes for Job. And if you were to read chapter 38, what God says to Job is, Job Look at these amazing things all around the world. Who made those things? Who caused those things to happen? And the answer, of course, is God. And then he further asks Job, Job, who are you? Who are you? And he repeatedly asks that question. And of course, the yeah, Inference is, Job, you couldn't do those things. And that's just chapter 38 and chapter 39. And the first time that Job responds to this is over in chapter 40. So 
Please turn over to chapter 40 with me. And uh, look at verse 3. It's the first time Job responds to all of that. And it says, Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. And do you know what God says in response to that? You would you imagine God was saying, that's okay, Job. But God replies in verses 6 through to 7. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Here's what he says. Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. In other words, Job, I ain't finished. And God starts again. And the thing is, in all that God says, not a hint of an explanation, not a hint of comfort, but the outcome is that Job is changed. Because if we go back to that chapter I read, chapter 42, look at verse 2. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things that were too wonderful for me. You said, listen now and, and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. See, there's been turbulence inside Job, but now Job is changed. All that anger goes away. The pride is humbled. He's changed and he's satisfied. And that's even in spite of getting not a hint of comfort and not a hint of explanation, but what God says to him is, this is who I am. Knowledge of God gives a new knowledge of self. Now, that's a turbulent experience. And it's not one that we would ever want, is it? But we would want, I think, the outcome, which is to have that new encounter, that new experience of God. So do we learn anything from all of this? I think there's a couple of things that we can learn. And the first one is this, that Job understands that we need to follow God for God's sake, and not for what we can get out of God. So we worship, we follow God simply for God's sake alone. I remember a number of years ago we read, was it Rick Warren's book? Um, and I think the line at the very start of that, and it says, the first lesson that we have to learn is that it's not about you. The inference, of course, it's about God. That's hard medicine. It's a lesson that we need to learn, but it is liberating. And in reality, if you were to turn back yet again, sorry about this, to Job chapter 1, this is where it all begins. Because this is how Satan goes up to God. If you look with me at verse 8 of Job chapter 1, it says, then the Lord said to, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then you look at Satan's response. Does Job fear God for nothing? And then into verse 10, Satan goes on to say, it's just like, you know, you've put a hedge around him. You've given him everything. 
But if you were to take some of that away, he would spit in your face. And so Satan is telling God, the only reason that Job is into God is because of the good things that he gives to him. And if you were to take those things away, Satan says Job would spit in God's face. But the way through the book of Job that God defeats Satan is through suffering and through the suffering of his servant. How does God refer to Job all the way through this book? You've already heard it this evening. Repeatedly, he says, have you considered my servant, Job? My servant, my servant. God defeats Satan here by turning Job into a servant. Satan was partly right, because for so many of us, the reason that we give off is because we can't cope with things being taken away from us. And the big lesson for us, particularly in an age when we live what we might call Christianity light, what I was maybe saying last Sunday morning, when people are only flavored by Jesus and not filled by Jesus, when we are content with watching perhaps many uh, preachers on TV who have this expectation that you ought to be blessed and rich and nothing should go wrong in your life, if that is our belief, then when these things are taken away from us, we will shout out to God and we will complain and we will gurn. But it only shows that our hearts aren't really fixed on God for God's sake alone. And what Job is teaching us is that it's about servanthood. And every piece of suffering that comes is to defeat Satan. And that's what Job understands. I'm the servant. You're the master. So one lesson that we need to learn is that it's not about you. It's about God. Got to learn that. And the second thing that we learn, I think, from the book of Job is that actually Job points us to somebody else. Job suffers. He suffers. And it is through his suffering that Satan is defeated. I also want you to look at chapter 42 and verse 8, where God gives him some advice what he has to do and says, so now take seven bulls and seven rams and go, and this is talking to Job's three mates, and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. Do you see again to whom Job points us? He's pointing us to the one that every servant of God points us and that is Jesus Christ himself. Do you remember a wee while ago what I was saying earlier, just tonight here, is how Job referred to himself as an innocent sufferer. I'm innocent. Job was partly right. But he wasn't totally innocent. But he points us to the one who is totally innocent. And the one through whom we are saved, Jesus Christ. The other thing that Job said about himself, as well as I'm innocent, is that Job says, I have been cut off from God and I cannot find God. And yet again, we would say to Job, no, you have not been cut off from God, but you point to another one who truly was cut off from God. When on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Job intercedes for his mates to get them in a right relationship with God, so Jesus Christ intercedes for us.
to put us in a right relationship with God because we know the innocent one and we know the intercessor. Job gets enough here. He doesn't know the half of what we know. Didn't know about Jesus, but he got enough. And the reason I think he got enough is because he kept pushing towards God. He kept praying. And the challenge even for us is to keep on praying through the difficulties so that you do go into that private room and you close the door and you pray to the one who is unseen. So that maybe even tonight, if you're suffering and you're saying that this is hard, and you're wondering where the explanation is, and you're wondering why this is happening the way it is, the reason is, is that you have to see the one who is in control of everything. You have to see the one who suffered for you innocently so that you know God, and then you know yourself. So I encourage you to stick with God to pray to God, to go after God. And like Job, then you'll be able to say, my eyes have seen him. Perhaps at this point, we'll just pray just before we come to our final song. But before we do that, let's just be, be still before God. Let's pray. Lord, your word challenges us. Our experience, if we are truthful, is that, of course, we struggle with suffering and pain. And we can hardly hold it together. That's why we need your grace in abundance. And through it all, Lord, we want to see you. We want to have a, a greater vision of who you are and that that outcome that Job was able to see and to grasp and to hold, Lord, we, we want to see you. We, we want to be close to you. We want to be held by you, particularly, Lord, when we flounder ourselves. Lord, we, of course, we don't want to go through the pain if we could avoid it. But Lord, we confess that you are God, that you are in control, and that you lead us through all these waters. So Lord, keep our eyes fixed on you. And maintain that sense of wonder at the grace of God and what you've done for us. Amen.